Muslim Brotherhood candidate Mohamed Morsi says he's the winner of Egypt's presidential race. But his rival, the Mubarak-era politician Ahmed Shafiq, has also claimed victory and accused the Islamist group of issuing false figures. At present, it looks as if the result may be irrelevant, given the creeping counter-revolution that seems to be underway. At the weekend, the military gave itself sweeping powers and locked lawmakers out of parliament, saying it was dissolved. There are fears of more unrest and violence on the streets. Counter-revolution in Egypt. Bitter battle for power. Our host on today's show, Ali Aslan. Hello and welcome to Quadriga. Egypt's former president Hosni Mubarak is on life support and he's not the only one as Egypt's young democracy is also in critical condition these days. But while Mubarak's recovery is rather unlikely, the future of Egypt is still up for grasp. And this is what we're going to discuss today, the future of Egypt together with Hamed Abdel Samad, who is a German-Egyptian political scientist and author of several best-selling books. Azim El Difraoui is a Middle East expert at the German Institute for International and Security Affairs. And Esther Saoub is a broadcast journalist with a focus on the Middle East. She was based as a correspondent in Cairo until last summer. Thank you all for being here. Hamed Abdel Samad, the Election Commission has just deli delayed the election <coughs> results because they, see, they say they need more time to look into the complaints by the two camps. How do you assess that? Do you think it's a legitimate reason or rather just a tactic by the military to gain more time? Well, legally, speak legally speaking, they have the right to delay the announcement of the results. But politically speaking, there are two opinions. The first one is saying the military council wants the ballots to be counted and recounted until it fits or matches their expectations until General Shafiq will win. Or they want to gain time to uh, have some kind of under table uh, debates and negotiations with the Muslim brothers about the influence of the military council over the next constitution and the political situation in Egypt. So I think it's just a game and has nothing to do with the ballots themselves, but about the plans of the military council, I think. Azimel Defraoui, would you agree with the assessment of Hamid Abdel Samad? Yeah, there is a key word on the Egyptian streets those days, which is laba, play. There's a huge play going on in Egypt. The military is playing, trying to push the limits. Uh, the military might even overstretch itself by pushing these limits very far. But it's clear for every Egyptian that there's a huge discussions going on all around Egypt between all parties, and especially the what they call like the deep powers, networks inside the government, but also networks uh, with the Muslim Brotherhoods. So the military definitely wants to win time and to try to find out how much it still can stretch um, in order to gain even more. Esther yes, Saud, the election commission is saying up to 400 complaints has been, have been issued by the two camps. Do you find that credible? I think so, yes, but um, it's not the first time that there are complaints being issued after elections. There have been complaints after the parliamentary elections, after the first round of the presidential elections. There were even more, a bigger number, and they didn't have to look at them for such a long time. I think there's a kind of a tragic aspect about all this, because Egyptian demo democracy, before even being implemented or haven't had the chance to grow is losing its credibility because people will say, what's this election? If it's postponed, it's repeated, the parliament was dissolved after even start, starting working. So I think for the people of Egypt, this is a really hard test now to still believe in democracy. But let me add to this, let me add to this. I think that might be exactly the aim of the military. I mean, like just letting rot democracy. Yeah. It's a process where they will try to create the impression that democracy is no desirable goal in Egypt. We have been talking about a game, and confusion is the name of the game, exactly, that they are confusing the people, they get, make them so exhausted so that nothing will exhaust uh, the Egyptian people anymore, 
And that's exactly what they tried to do with the Egyptian parliament. They tried to make it look silly to the public. Uh, they didn't concentrate on the serious issues that were discussed inside this parliament, but on the very funny issues about uh, the laws to marry uh, uh, 14-year-old girls, laws to uh, sleep with your own wife after she, uh, she died uh, in the first six hours, just like things that make people really got confused and started to lose belief in democracy, as you mentioned, and feel exhausted. And that's exactly the reason why we have something in this election which is quite uh, 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 interesting. The General Shafiq was not called General Shafiq as he was chosen by Mubarak to be the prime minister, but Dr. Shafiq. But now as he came as a, a presidential election, people start, uh, the military council start to call him General Shafiq, the strong man who will stop this state of confusion, who will bring security back, who will bring credibility back to the Egyptian politics. That's the game. Confusion is the name of the game. Well, confusion, a big word, but of course there was anything but confusion about the constitutional declaration given and issued by the military. It gave, the declaration gave the military wide-ranging legislative powers, for instance, over the budget, and basically they are now their own boss. Isn't that the case, Esther So? Yes, exactly. I mean, they are the one to... Uh, to implement, to have, to implement the power of people, or to prolong somebody, to, to decide who is in there in the in the Supreme Council and who is not, and this is, I mean, it's not a sharing of powers as we know it, although it's quite common in the Middle East and in other countries of the world. We should not forget about this that our democracy is not something all being there all over the world. But I think there's also some other points in these. Uh, amendments, if we would call them, or in this declaration, which is, for example, that an Egyptian president cannot declare war against another country without the military council. And knowing the relationship between the military, Supreme Military Council and the USA, this is a very important point, making sure that there cannot be any president showing up, making decisions the US would not back, for example. There several uh, points in this declaration which let people worry about it. Azimel Defraoui, does it even matter who becomes the next president? Because the constitutional declaration issued by the military uh, sort of reduces the president to a figurehead like the Queen of England, doesn't it? I believe it still matters a lot. I think um, the generals um, won their game so far, but they really pushed it to the limit. They need a president. They need somebody who takes responsibility, at least formal responsibility, for running the affairs of the country. Um, but obviously they want to reduce the powers of this president as much as possible. But it will matter to have a president because the military must somehow be aware that they cannot run this country of 80 million people. So they need at least if something goes wrong, to blame somebody. You know, they will need a scapegoat and this would need to be the president. If the military would really govern formally and um, establish a total military dictatorship, any blame of what's going wrong in Egypt, and there's so many social and other problems, would be directly going to the military, and that's something they really want to avoid. Ahmed Abdel Samad, the military is uh, sort of reducing, as I said, the next president to a rather toothless figure, because it's a president without a constitution and a parliament. Isn't that the case? This is the case, and under normal conditions, it would be all right. I mean, the revolution came to take the teeth out of the president and uh, to uh, take the scepter out of the, the, the pharaoh. But the results should not be. We, we went to the Tahrir Square because we wanted Mubarak not to give the power to his son. But now what we are having is Mubarak is giving the power to his father, mm -hmm. to the military. Mm -hmm. So it's just the same game, but uh, uh, the power is going back to where it always has been with the military. Um, I understand when the military is saying we cannot uh, let the next president have the legislative and the executive power at the same time. That's fine. But the military is having the executive and the legislative power at the same time. The elected president will be punished by the, by the parliament, but the non-elected military council cannot be punished by the parliament. That's absurd. Um, 
the parliament, which had been chosen by the people, didn't have the power to make laws, but the military council is issuing laws and is dealing with, uh, with the law, I'm sorry to use this word, like a prostitute. Like it's, he's, it's just like not respecting the law. And if you really want to establish the state of law, you have to show the people that nobody is above this law. And that's the lesson we should have learned from the era of Mubarak, that once we allow somebody to be above the law, a, state, a democracy can never be established, and dictatorship is just a question of time. And as yourself, the military is also reserving the right to pick the people who are going to write the next uh, constitution. It's also saying that it is going to hand over power by the end of this month. Do you still believe that that's going to happen? Uh, I don't think so, because it's, it's a they won't be ready by the end of this month, I'm afraid. I mean, to whom would they hand over the power? There's only going to be the president with tiny little possibilities to act because there, there won't be a constitution by the end of this month. And without a constitution, there are no parliamentary elections. So how can you have um, a government without a parliament? It's going to take more time. I think there's one positive issue about all this, if you can call it positive. It's what you mentioned, uh, uh, overstretching. When I, I remember after, the, after Mubarak stepped down, like before Mubarak, even before Mubarak stepped down, when the police left the streets and the military came, everybody was so happy about it. I remember the tanks on Tahrir Square and everybody wanted to take pictures sitting on a tank or giving their children to soldiers, hold them and I take a picture. And this has changed now. The, the uh, glory of the military has diminished. And but that's I think why they need to hand over power quite quickly, at least formally. I mean, they won't be able to run the country for another year. But I mean, yeah. Egypt is in limbo, so it's, a, it's, it's really a dangerous situation in a sense. Mm -hmm. But um, when I was last week in Egypt, I still felt that there's a lot of optimism in Egypt. Strangely enough, the people themselves believe that the military will not endlessly govern, and they also believe that the wheel can't be turned back, that Egypt can't become the same kind of dictatorship as under Mubarak. Mm -hmm. So I wish I can share the optimism of the Egyptian people, but still um, it seems to be a fair assessment to say um, that there needs to be rapid change at this stage, and I hope the military is aware, because a lot of people also say, well, we let the military do for another month or two, but the fear factor in Arab society, in Egyptian society, is totally gone. We don't have any fear anymore, and if things don't change rapidly, we'll again go to the street. That's what every Egyptian I spoke to said, um, either liberals or Muslim brothers, it doesn't really matter. The fear factor is gone. So I don't think the military stay, can stay in power endlessly. Well, the military may not be able to stay in power endlessly, but who will take over next? Who will become Egypt's next president? That, of course, is still undetermined. But let's take a look at the front runner, if you can believe the polls, namely that of Mohamed Morsi, the candidate of the Muslim Brotherhood, who many believe will be the next president in Egypt. Let's have a look at who Mohamed Morsi is. Mohamed Morsi didn't get this far thanks to his charisma. He wasn't widely known before he became the Muslim Brotherhood's presidential candidate. The engineer only stepped in after the organization's top strategist was disqualified. But he has the backing of Egypt's best disciplined and best funded civilian organization. For over eight decades, the Muslim Brotherhood was outlawed as a political entity in its birthplace. Yet the Islamist group has deep roots in the country due to its charitable services for the poor. Its ideological profile is less clear. The Muslim Brotherhood's Freedom and Justice Party stood for parliament after its legalization following the 2011 revolution and became the largest political force in both houses. Originally, the party had pledged not to field a candidate for the presidency so as not to monopolize power but reversed its decision in April. Well, Hamed Abdel Samad, Mohamed Morsi is claiming victory. His supporters are certainly claiming victory. He's, of course, the candidate of the Muslim Brotherhood. Now, how would you assess the 
how would Egypt change under a president who's, who's ruled by the Muslim Brotherhood? So I think under the current situation, the Muslim Brothers are not able to change the political character of Egypt. What they will try to do is to uh, do some kind of identity cosmetics, to change some laws, uh, moral laws, but cannot go to the depth of the state, cannot change uh, the laws about tourism or about banks or whatever. They cannot apply Sharia. They will try to apply Sharia light to satisfy their supporters, of course. But they cannot change the character of Egypt right now. I don't, still don't believe that they are heading for democracy. They are heading for anything which will establish their power and keep them away from illegality. On the other hand, the military council is stretching the game to the limit, but I don't think that the military council is wishing to keep all the powers, but try to poker with the Muslim brothers to ask for too much, so at least at the end it will get uh, autonomy for the army and the issues of the army, and I guess this could be the outcome out of this situation. This could be the solution if enough rational people on base, both sides are sitting on the negotiation tables. That's yourself, uh, Hamid Abdel Samad doesn't seem to think that religion is going to take over in Egypt with the Muslim Brotherhood. What do you think? I think there's a very important point we have to mention. When you compare the results of the parliamentary, parliamentary election, where the Muslim Brotherhood's party and the Salafi party together gained a large majority of the votes. Approximately 40%. Yeah. 70%. 70, 70, 70, not 40. Both together, 70. Yes. together. Yeah. Together. So yes. all Islamists together had 70% of the votes. Mm -hmm. And in the first round of the presidential election, there were only 24, 25 mm -hmm. for uh, Mohammed Morsi. So now, if he can gain more than 50%, it means that half of the votes come from people who didn't vote for him in the first round. And he has to keep these people. If he disappoints them by stupid decisions in their eyes, by, by uh, two conserv conservative decisions, they will, he, he will lose his power. And then the second thing is what, what uh, Abdul Azim mentioned, that they are not afraid anymore. Everybody will tell you, I'm going to go to the street if this president is not doing what I want. The only problem is if he doesn't have the power to do anything, it, mm. if he doesn't have the power to do anything because the military keeps the power and puts him as a puppet, then it's going to be a very difficult situation. And what the Muslim Brothers are about to understand right now is that they need to be backed by the people, by the civil society, by the, by the revolutionary camp against the military council. The military council is becoming very uh, unpredictable and is not trustable any, anymore from the side of the Muslim Brothers. So they know they need allies from the civil camp. And if they don't secure this alliance, they will be in quite danger that the, the military council is seizing the opportunity to kick them out the first moment they, uh, they can do that. And second, they need the civil camp also to govern, to have experts in the economy, uh, in the foreign policy, and in many, many other things to penetrate through this deep state that Mubarak and his uh, regime were building over the last three decades. And I would like to add something to it. If we go back to the presidential elections we, and analyze the results, we have really interesting results. We have two very polarizing candidates who won, but the majority of the Egyptians voted for a center. Over 50% um, of um, Egypt voted for middle ground. So all the presidential candidates, the two remaining, are very well aware that they need to compose with a political center mm -hmm. and they need all the expertise. So everybody is trying to open up to revolutionaries from the center, but also to the technocratic elite, which is so necessary to govern Egypt. So this is maybe one of the very few positive aspects that both candidates know they can't govern without the center in Egypt. And hopefully the military is also aware of that. So maybe this is one of the rare positive aspects in all this confusion and all the bad news we had recently from Egypt. And this shows, and I think we should not forget, forget when we talk about the game of the military, we should remember the people. And I think it's, it's an amazing result how quickly the Egyptian society, which never talked about politics, with 
people who never had any influence on what's happening in their country, how quickly they became very aware, politically thinking uh, people of 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 a state like i know so many egyptians who never talked about politics and now they tell you i away i wake up with the news and i go to bed with the news and you can tell it from the results you can tell it from the big outcome of from the big number of voters it's not if you compare it to europe like 40 percent or so it's not so much but before you had like two or three percent so it's really a lot of people and you you should remember that they have to many of them have to travel for voting because they don't uh, register where they live they come from upper egypt they work in cairo they're still registered in upper egypt they travel eight hours to go for voting then they stand another two or three hours in front of the polling center Yeah, so still, this, this is, is a, this is still this is very positive. So people yes, are interested in politics. This is what I was but, was but, trying but, to but say. So no, far, don't forget the people. But so far, politics doesn't do anything for the people. I mean, politics are discussed, but there is no real political reform in Egypt so far. The real political and economical issues have not been addressed by anybody. And this can create massive discontent among the people very quickly. And then we'll go, get into a really dangerous situation where we'll have um, not only demonstrations uh, against the military rule, but maybe bread riots again, um, massive social unrest. So as longer we stay in this limbo, as much we increase the risk of major social un unrest. So this is an aspect which seems, among the other positive things we earlier on mentioned, yeah, the, um, quite crucial. This self-empowerment has two sides, of course. Like On the one hand, it's very good that we have this psychological rapture inside Egypt and the political, that uh, the, the wall of fear has fallen and people are not afraid of any authority anymore. That's very positive. But when every single person feels self-empowered in the sense of political without having the instruments to uh, deal with that democratically then you have some groups of people who are blocking themselves of b b b or blocking each other and that's what we are seeing in the polarization of the elections among the parties but also among these two candidates well certainly the election is extremely polarized uh, between Mohamed Morsi and of course the other candidate who's also claiming victory Ahmed Shafiq he portrays himself or has rather portrayed himself during the election process as a man of law and order do you think that's his mass appeal that at a time of social unrest the the, the yearning for law and order is so great that people might might be inclined to vote for somebody who's actually regarded as part of the old regime? Yeah, this is the irony of the situation that we are having in Egypt, but this is also a part of the game of the military council, like making the people feel so exhausted, lack of food, lack of jobs, so that they become tired. With, withdrawing police from central Cairo. There's exactly. nearly the security, no police in the central the Cairo. The security situation is de has deteriorated uh, massively. And all of that let people become tired of democracy before democracy has been established. Uh, make people also turn against the revolution and make the revolution responsible for everything. And uh, of course, because there is still lack of political awareness and people don't understand that the result, the chaos that we are having, right now uh, is not the result of the revolution, it's the result of the 30 years before. So therefore it's a positive thing that we see the garbage that the old regime has been uh, 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 hiding all the time, it's coming out, but it's also ironical to uh, vote for somebody like Ahmed Shafiq, who failed as a prime minister, who is the last prime minister under Mubarak, who was the prime minister during the demonstrators were attacked by the camels and the horses and he did nothing to protect them. How could he be able to restore stability and security again? I think he's a part of the problem, just like the military council is a part of the problem. You don't restore stability by having a polarizing personality as the president of Egypt. And Esther Saoub, that is a big frustration on the part of the voters, isn't it? On one part, on one hand, they don't want to vote for Morsi, perhaps, to, to, become, to get a more religious Egypt, if you will. But they don't also want to vote for Shafiq, uh, to vote in the old people that they went to the streets in the first place. So 
uh, you see the lower turnout each time as election comes up. Do you think it's, it's none of the above, you know, the none of the above mantra is really setting in in Egypt? You know what a friend told me? He went to the polling station and he took this paper and then he covered Morsi's face and he kept looking on Shafiq. And then he put his cross under Morsi. <laughs> because, you know, none of the two, but he said, I, I, I cannot bear Shafiq, so Morsi is still the, the better of the bad. So uh, um, I think, um, yeah, there are some people being frustrated because as Azim mentioned, it's the majority voted for completely different candidates. It could have been really a great movement by the Brotherhood to step back and let Hamdin Sabahi run against Shafiq. But Morsi wants power. He, do, he doesn't really want to have to change the country. I, because, I agree because with you. Because the Muslim Brotherhood don't trust the people of Egypt and they don't <coughs> trust the military yeah, council. And they think they have to keep the power in their hands yeah. because they cannot trust both. We are, we are, we are, um, we are talking about two people, um, two candidates, and we're talking about the military. But um, let us talk a little more about Egypt and its society. I mean, these people are not alone. Egypt is a very unique, a very special society. It's a very clientelistic society where you're nothing without huge networks. Those networks might be hidden, they might be in public, but it's a game between networks. It's a game between an old establishment, um, which allied itself with the military, um, a modern establishment, um, which looks around to whom to go. Some of them went to Shafiq, others went to Morsi. And we have the huge interests of the Muslim Brotherhood. I mean, Morsi is nothing without the apparatus of the Muslim Brotherhood. And the Muslim Brotherhood is not a network of poor people. It's not only, it's not only militants or it's huge industrial interests, for example, as well. I mean, the guide of the Muslim Brotherhood is one of the richest persons in Egypt. So there's a lot of behind the networking scheming going on, there's a lot of negotiations going on, and nobody stands alone. And how to create a new balance and a political deal in Egypt, it's something very difficult to tell. But also coming back to this political demography in Egypt, it's very interesting to know that we have two great electoral, cam electoral camps in Egypt, the, the um, military and the uh, supporters of the older regime and the camp of stability and the camp of the Muslim Brothers. Both have very good experience of mobilizing people, bringing people to uh, uh, the polls. But the result, as you said, we have the majority in the middle, like Sabahi and Abu Futuha, people who are politically unknown, they just appear in the last uh, 18 months, and they get as much as those two camps without this electoral machine, without these voting machines in all the provinces of Egypt. So this is the future, I think. This middle, which is still to grow and still to build its own institutions, and maybe, maybe, if we can draw any positive um, assessment to this but we all power, sound, we all sound power very, fighting. We all this, sound very this, optimistic. This power what what game, came wrong? This, what power, came? this power game between the Muslim brother and the military right now can lead Egypt into hell and maybe even into political uh, chaos, yes. But it can also be a chance for the third camp to learn politics and to build up itself if the economy of the country will not Highly collapse. Highly optimistic. Yeah, it is. But... I think this is the only thing you can do right now when two old foxes are fighting together. You have to seize your opportunity to use the time to breathe in and build up your institutions and uh, mobilize your people. I think if we will have parliamentary elections in the next three or four months, the results will be completely different than the last parliamentary result, because now we have the new party of al Baradei al-Dastur. We will have a new left power behind Hamdan Sabahi, and this will change the political map of Egypt, I think, very soon. Yes, sir, so uh, there are some critics who are saying that the demonstrators had no plan and no vision of really what to do afterwards. Uh, they went out on the streets, they knew what they didn't want, but they didn't really make clear what they wanted afterwards. Uh, because if you look at it, everything 
still pretty much the same, isn't it? What has really changed since the revolution in Egypt? The most important thing that changed is that fear has disappeared. The second thing is that even though military can uh, um, put people uh, in front of military courts, even if people are in prison, still there's more freedom of speech and more freedom of the media changed. I mean, some of them changed back, but you still have newspapers trying to, to give you different opinions. But you're right. I mean, they didn't have any plans for the future. Their advantage was that they didn't have a headquarter even. I remember I did lots of interviews in autumn 2010 with people who afterwards became important, like Ahmad Maha from 6th of April. And back then, Ahmad told me, our office is the internet and our telephone is Facebook. So they didn't even have a figure who you could just catch from the security apparatus. So it was their chance that it was like a, a grassroots movement, but then it was the problem that they didn't have a plan. But I, I totally agree with Hamid, and I'm optimistic too, because if you take Abdel Munam Abul Futuwa's campaign, he had 100,000 volunteers, and most of them never had anything to do with politics or networking like the Brotherhood and the National Democratic Party. All these people are there, and they will, they will keep on, even though he didn't win the elections. And if they go into... I mean, we have to give this some time. I remember people telling me on the street when I asked them about the presidential election and all the people came with, ah, oh, the Muslim Brotherhood, they say, okay, we're not voting for a pharaoh. We're voting for a president. He stays there for some years, and then there's the next election, and everything can change. So I think we can be optimistic, even though there's a great danger and there's a ticking bomb, maybe. Well, the likelihood that the next president will stay another 30 years, as Mubarak did, is indeed rather unlikely, but Azim al Defraoui, because... I mean, the they're rather too old, by the way, anyway, so... <laughs> <laughs> don't live for 30 years. But since the media was mentioned, the mm. state of the media in Egypt, there was the, the MENA news agency who reported mm. on the Mubarak death, so to speak. Uh, mm. um, how much credibility would you give reports, uh, give to reports by the Egyptian media? I mean, the Egyptian media is in total transformation, you know. They're highly skilled journalists, partly, you know, who do amazing work. Then there are old government journalists who really do still disinformation campaigns. Then there's a whole young generation of journalists and bloggers who simply um, don't have really the standards of reporting, you know. So there's a lot of confusion going on, but still there's huge progress. I mean, most information is fairly reliable. Things are debated very um, openly. Even the government newspaper and its website, al Akham, the oldest Egyptian newspaper, um, tries to do somehow balanced reporting. So in this sense, I'm quite optimistic. There's lots of things to do. But um, there we see huge progress. I mean, tremendous progress. But I would like to come back um, to the worst case scenario. I'm myself too optimistic, yeah? But I mean, I'd really like to draw the attention to the huge risk we are facing. Um, the Salafis, you know, nobody was speaking about the Salafis in Egypt, and they made 20 or 30 percent in the Egyptian parliamentary vote. Now they seem to be less popular again, um, but those people, I mean, some of them are very highly radicalized, you know, highly radicalized and ready to go back to the street and violently go back to the street if nothing is changing. Um, as mentioned earlier, or I mean, I would really like us also to think what can go wrong and what can be done against it, you know, yes. I mean, like, um, it's nice to say we are in a 19, 1848 situation, democracy is starting somewhere, it will take another 50 or 100 years to have real democracy, but I mean, there are huge risks, as we know from European ris and history. And all the ingredients for the total chaos are there, and yes, I also consider the other scenario, if things will not be put on the right track if the military council and the Muslim brother would not find a good compromise and will associate also the other uh, political powers and the revolutionary camp in their work, then we will end up having people getting back to the streets. And this time, I don't think that the major role or part of this revolution, the second wave of the revolution, will be by the laptop and Facebook generation, but it will be those radicalized Salafists who will feel betrayed that they didn't get what they wanted, and 
the young men from the slums of Egypt yeah, who sure. didn't participate in the first wave of the revolution and now they are feeling this self-empowerment and they come back and the issue of social justice is that what is moving them and that's where the danger could be, that's where violence could come from, and that's what we hope that will not be the scenario which will be the actual one. A lot of my Egyptian friends here, yeah, they use one German keyword to describe the current um, situations. They say it's the Weimar Republic. Yeah. It will take years and we might have a horrible outcome, but let's hope not so. Yeah, the comparisons are so many. They are comparing it to the Weimar situation. They are comparing it to the Romanian revolution and the re-establishment of the old regime, uh, again, under Eliescu. And some are also uh, comparing it to the Ukrainian Orange Revolution and what happened after that, that it didn't end up bringing people the fruits that they were hoping to get after this revolution. Well, certainly it's going to take a lot of time to, to diminish the influence of the military over Egypt. After 30 years, they are very much involved and own up to 40 percent, if you will, of the businesses also in, in Egypt. So it's going to take a lot of time and more than perhaps one revolution. But I want to talk about the international dimension of this uh, internal conflict. So far, we've been uh, talking much about the situation in Egypt. Uh, but of course, there's an international dimension as well, isn't there, Esther Saub? I mean, the U.S. plays a huge role. It pays up to $1.3 billion each year in aid to the military. And President Obama has just recently resumed the aid in March again to the military. Do you think that was a mistake? I'm not sure. I mean, if you look at the U.S. policy, it's not, because they want to keep their influence on the Egyptian military. And First and foremost, they want to have Israel safe. And you have to, inf to ha because the, the Egyptian military is the strongest military, military around Egypt. So they don't want to lose their influence. And they have the influence by the money, of course. But on the other hand, if they wanted to change something, the USA, USA would be the part who could change quickly, because as soon as they talk about these 1.3 billion, they, ha they can change something within the military council. The only thing is that I'm not sure if they want to, if they really want Egypt to be a real democracy and That's if they're true. still afraid of Morsi. <laughs> they have learned something from the past that they should have learned that supporting a dictator doesn't mean supporting stability because they were mixing up the word stability with the word stagnation. And the chaos that we are having now is the result of the dictatorship. The chaos we are having in Syria and elsewhere in the Arab world is because of the long decades of the dictatorship. And that's what the United States, but also Europe, should understand. They should not be happy to have a strong military which will control everything again and call it stability. They should put their hands finally in the hands of those who are investing for democracy, who are investing for change. They should push their partners to meet the demands of the street. There is another very important international dimension to the events in Egypt. The Tunisian revolution was very important for Egypt as an example for Egypt and the Egyptian revolutionaries followed the ideas and the lead of um, Tunisia. But what really started the transformation in the Arab world was the Egyptian uh, revolution. Egypt got back its leading role as an example in the Arab world. Without Egypt, we wouldn't have had uh, transformation changes in Syria, um, in Yemen, um, in Libya, and no hope for democratic change in the Arab world. So if Egypt is reverting back to a dictatorship, we'll also run into the risk that um, the Arab world as a whole will stagnate in uh, corrupt dictatorships for many, many decades. That's, sure. why, that's why when we are talking about uh, the influence of uh, foreign powers, we should not forget why is the Egyptian revolution countered by the strongest counter-revolution, it's also because of some regional power like Saudi Arabia who are not interested at all. Not that at democracy all. Not will at be all. established in Egypt, that otherwise this will be a model. And, and interestingly enough, for instance, it's, it's, it's a very important point. We are talking about, if we are talking about Islamic politics, you know, we should initially we could believe that Saudi Arabia would like to have Muslim brothers in power in Egypt. That's exactly what they don't want to have. Um, the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt 
compared to the Saudi royal system, is a party who wants to have accountable government, who wants to have a parliament, um, who wants to have um, some ways a republic. And that's exactly, for example, what the Saudis and the Gulf monarchies at as they on the whole, don't want to have. So there's also strong regional interest uh, not to have democratization They don't like in the Egypt. Muslim Brother, but they like the Salafists because the Salafists are still considering democracy to be just a Trojan horse to get back to the caliphate, caliphate and they are adoring the governor. They are not allowed to protest or to have a revolution against the governor, and that's exactly what the Saudi uh, royal family want to hear. But as Sir Saup, uh, as email de Frau raises a good point, uh, namely that uh, the conduct on the part of the military might set a bad example for other autocratic countries in Arab in the Arab world, and Syria, of course, is very much on the minds of the international community. Somebody like Assad might might uh, look at the conduct of the military and might be emboldened. Of course, I mean we saw this before. We saw as soon as. Uh, there was this change in Yemen. Um, other countries started to, they started an uprising. The, the government was acting violently. And even in Egypt, there was this influence. But uh, on the other, I think for, for the West or for the European countries, it's also one thing they should think about. When, I mean, we need Northern Africa for energy and we need to have somebody to deal with. And I think dealing with Dictators is much worse than dealing with organizations not being not depending on a government. So, on the long hand, it would be a, a much better thing to have for us as a partner. One quick last round: Who's <clears throat> going to be the next president of Egypt? I hope not the military. Esther Saud. Uh, I think it's going to be Shafiq. Ahmed Abdel Samad. I think it's going to be Morsi or the second wave of the revolution. So we see three different opinions here to one question of course Egypt is very much uh, in the focus of the international community these days and I suspect it will continue to be so thank you all out there for watching thank you to my guests and we look forward to seeing you next next week